Gardens of the Moon is the first novel in the Malzan Book of the Fallen, epic fantasy series. It was written by Steven Erickson, and like all of Erickson's Malazan books, Gardens of the Moon is big, it's broad, it's complicated, and loaded with amazing characters and locations. My name's David, you're watching Storybound. Let's dive into Malazan Book of the Fallen, Gardens of the Moon. I'm a bit of a moron when people talk about prose, but I feel like this is what they're talking about. The entire novel, not quite entirely poetic, but the descriptions and conversations still roll off the tongue like a creepy and fantastical retelling of a story, Fireside, from a master storyteller. In fact, the whole book reminds me of when you first are reading the prologue for a series, which often tend to be kind of bonkers, and display what the end could be. They show you high concept gods, high level magic, and all this super cool stuff, then kick it back to our basic ass level 1 farmer protagonist who needs to level up to catch up to the prologue scale. However, in Malazan Book of the Fallen, at least in Gardens of the Moon, the entire book has that type of whimsical magic that intrigues you and keeps dialing it up each and every page. Slight tangent here, but I used to play a lot of D&D, starting to get back into it, and even till pre-COVID was playing maybe once a month. But this series reminds me of a bunch of max level characters who have no business still messing around in the realm are still doing just that. We're introduced to these high power, high stakes characters, and it never stops. I can definitely feel the D&D love in this book, and it wears it on its sleeve, and it appeals to me on a major level. I actually googled to see if this was a D&D campaign at some point because some of the spells feel ripped right out of my second edition spell books. And I actually had to dig them out of storage to nerd out for a bit. The book takes place in the continent of Genabacus and some side stories on other continents. The area we're dealing with here, more specifically Pale and Darugistan. The main areas where stuff goes down we do get some in a place called the Rivery Plains and the Black Dog Forest, but this world apparently is massive. And looking at the maps, the world definitely is massive. And it does have no name from what I can tell, but apparently based on a joke Steven Erickson um, made, people have been calling it Woo. I'm saying apparently way too much. Uh, this is probably because upon reading this book, I honestly felt a weird combination of blown away, overwhelmed, and eager for more. The characters, the environments, and the level of detail that is provided here is a barrage while I imagine the sprawling world, the war and the conflicts that we are being introduced to, as well as the powers that have dug deep into this world as we watch some of the fantastical unfold. One of the early scenes has a particularly powerful caster raining down spells while a city is falling and a massive war is unfolding. I need to go back and reread this book at some point because while I was reading the scene, I was starting to realize this book was something different. As the title implies, Malazan are a focus here. And specifically in this book, I would say Empress Lacine and Adjunct Lorne take more of central roles. Lacine and the other Malas spread their forces to conquer realms one by one, forcing them under the rule of the Malazan Empire. These forces are filled with strong warriors, wizards, and sorceresses from the Malazan Second and Six, including a commander named Fist Dujek as well as the Bridge Burners, who are an infamous brigade within the realm, one of which is named Tattersail, the caster I mentioned earlier. During the Siege of Pale, a giant spherical shape materializes and carries a fortress atop of it. The Moonspawn itself was originally controlled by the Tistiandi, a non-human elder race. Those known are the Korlat Shinnok and the infamous Anamander Rake who was the only character I was moderately familiar with uh, before starting this series. Commander Rake is the son of darkness, a dark elf drow 
a badass looking hyper intelligent uh, and beyond human in terms of power and ability. He's the current leader of the Tiste Andy and looks amazing in literally every single piece of art I can find of him online. The Bridge Burners were also a pretty awesome group in the series. Some of the most notable being Whiskey Jack, who is kind of your all around noble soldier. And then there's Quick Ben, who while writing this, I realize how much mages, wizards, and sorcerers in this series friggin rule. Quick Ben is a smart mouth character who somehow manages to be even better in Dead House Gates. Sorry if that's a spoiler, but Erickson's portrayal of this character who just walks the line of obvious badass and someone who is able to stay under people's radar is pretty top tier. I personally feel this book, as I stated before, has a ton of meat on its bones, and the read itself feels like it's about as high fantasy as something could get. And I mean that in a positive. I do find I had a hard time retaining some of the information, however, I have a playlist already saved of YouTubers explaining what the hell happened uh, in this series book by book and some pretty serious breakdowns. Where someone like Brandon Sanderson gives you direct, specific, and obvious explanations, character beats something I would compare to a Marvel movie, I know people do this all the time, but with significantly more payoff. Uh, in the majority of his books. Steven Erickson has a level of prose and flowery wording that makes you feel like you're reading an epic tale, literally from the pages of the Malisan, Book of the Fallen. I was originally overwhelmed, not just by the book, but the idea of reviewing this book justice, because there's so many epic moments, so many things I would love to talk about, like the Warrens and how they remind me of the throne worlds from Destiny and the planes and dungeons and dragons kind of fuse together. Or what the hell is going on with the damn coin in this book and the predictions of fate and how things that don't even seem important in one chapter obtaining relevance later on in the book. I'm not even sure this is a review of Malazan at this point. It's more of just a rant and me finally wanting to get something out on this amazing book. But the dauntily huge book, which is part one, of an even more colossal series, I personally feel even if you're on the fence and wanting to read the entire series, reading one book alone, Gardens of the Moon, is enough of an experience as a single novel that allows you to peer into a terrible, dark, absurdly magical, war-torn lands of Genovacus. I imagine this book is what someone feels like walking into a D&D campaign that is already a tight-knit group who have players playing every weekend for 10 plus years, trying to figure out how the world works, why every city has a name, why every character feels like they are just as important of a backstory as the player characters, and everybody already understands the rules. Either way, Gardens of the Moon is just that, a long, dark walk into the garden, a complex world for new adventurers that are ready to dig into something fantastical and sprawling. I can see how this could be off-putting for some people, but for those who just want to live in the beauty of the novel and let go of the need to be in control, demanding they understand the motives of all the characters and factions right out of the gate, you will find yourself to experience one of the best fantasy novels I have ever read. Thanks for watching Storybound. Please like and subscribe. And as always, have a good one.